Disclaimer in the past I was invited by the Panzer Museum Munster and the Tank Museum at Bovington. Hello everyone. Today we have a special guest, a former German tanker who already helped me out on several of the last videos and he is not just a former German tanker, he also fought the conflict between Russia and Ukraine since 2014, so far longer than most. May I introduce you to Tobias? Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Tobias. I'm a former gunner and loader on Leopard 2 and I'm following this conflict since uh, 2014. The reason I followed it, it was basically like the first conflict in Europe uh, that was available for everyone on the internet. You could go on YouTube or Live League back then and you can, you were able to follow it like live. And that was like the first conflict uh, where this happened. And also it was the first conflict that signs the Yugoslavia war. So it was uh, the first war of our generation. This war with uh, its tank battles, for example, the Battle of the Balsewe and Iluvaisk, played a big role of me in becoming a tanker in making my interest in tanks way bigger and I started to collect uh, manuals, regulations, doctrine books of Eastern armies and Western armies. So not only Bundeswehr, but also a Warsaw Pact. So I got a bit insight on not only our tanks, but also on T-72s, T-55s, uh, T-64s and so on. And how long did you serve? I served for three years on a Leopard 2. So my first question is basically... When you looked, especially on the videos from 2022, but also before, um, what did you recognize when you see uh, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers on how they were employed, especially in contrast to the training you received? Well, the biggest difference I saw that there was uh, a difference uh, that goes for both sides, that there are completely uh, different behaviors inside army. For example, the Russians behaved in the north in the area of Sumi, completely different than, for example, in Kherson. If you know, for example, on the bridge of Kherson, the Russians managed to uh, destroy several Ukrainian tanks in just short uh, time without uh, heavy losses there. And uh, you can compare that to heavy losses in the north. So you see that uh, they behave different. But also what we saw where, or what uh, catch my eye is, a big misuse of tanks, like uh, they weren't really prepared for this situation. And if you think about that, uh, Russia planned this war for at least eight years now, since it started 2014, uh, they, s they did bad. But also did the Ukrainians bad in the beginning on some situations, but uh, the Russians, uh, it was not really great. I mean, if you see the their tanks, like uh, the T-80 BVM, T-72B3M and T-80UK or even T-90s got straight up uh, abandoned. They just uh, let them stand there in the open and uh, Ukrainians just uh, captured them. We didn't saw any scuttling of this vehicle like we saw later with the T-90M when it got lost. So that's one thing. Uh, we, we learned basically that you don't uh, allow the enemy to use your tank. If you have to abandon it, uh, you can either destroy damage or just render it inoperable for a, a short time. You can do it by simply taking out electronic parts of the fire control system. Keep in mind we're talking about those videos that were shared on, from both sides and those might have been heavily selected so that you, it could be that we only see the worst behaviors and so it could be that there's a lot of footage we don't really see where they behave in a very effective way. This might be a misrepresentation, so we talk only about what was available to us. So this is, of course, a perception issue. Yeah, and uh, what we also saw uh, in uh, Sharkiv, in Sharkiv that uh, tanks uh, straight up drove into towns, also uh, infantry fighting vehicles. For example, on day one, MTLBs driving straight into uh, Kharkiv and they're getting destroyed. They didn't even deploy the infantry, they just drove into the town and expecting no enemy or resistance. But this... Uh, went on not only on the first day, I think everyone saw this uh, famous video of uh, n -Law getting fired from a window on the tank. And uh, n uh, did nothing because the arming distance was, uh, the distance to the tank was too short uh, for arming the rocket. And that shows also that uh, the Russians used the tanks as uh, like spearhead even inside towns. Uh, and the infantry is only following way behind, not uh, the other way around. As would be general doctrine in nearly every army as far as I know. Yes.
also we saw uh, many videos that the tanks had uh, way too big distances between each other. So they couldn't support each other in the beginning on some situations in the combat, not on uh, street marches. On street marches you saw them uh, driving closely, but uh, in combat situations you see how the Ukrainians basically picked them up uh, one by one because they were so big uh, separated from each other. So w what is the usual combat distance from your experience that you should have? For my experience, uh, depending on the terrain, but it should be 50 to 100 meters. Uh, and it's important that you can see the next tank with your eyes. So he can support you and you can support him. If you go with bigger distances, uh, he can't really support you. And uh, that's uh, the reason also why you ha should never operate alone. And we also saw several tanks operating completely alone in this conflict. Yeah, for me, it's very interesting because what the distances you describe and all the other things is basically a doctrine of the level of the Second World War. And from what I remember, I think Chifton once mentioned that in terms of tank tactics, uh, very little in some regards hasn't changed since then. You also mentioned, we, we chatted a bit before, the difference in use of smoke, especially. We learned a lot of uh, deploying smoke because the smoke is on your tank. You have them and we rarely see them. If you get engaged and you want to get out of it without getting killed, you could just uh, pop the smoke and retreat. And uh, we rarely see this, even if nearly all tanks have these smoke launchers on the turret. Also, uh, keep in mind that uh, nearly all Russian tanks are able to deploy smoke via the X-Towers. Um, so by, by mixing basically diesel uh, fuel into the engine, we will provide a short video here because there was one at Tank Fest. One thing is, from, from my understanding, the Bundeswehr is probably trained very much in a delaying action in the Verzögerungsgefecht, because back in the, in the Cold War, it was basically the idea that Germany would try to hold off the first spearhead if the Warsaw Pact would attack. And so I suspect that you were heavily trained on, on, on the Verzögerungsgefecht delaying action, which requires a lot of use of smoke to stay combat effective, but also attrition the enemy. Could it be that this was less of an issue in the former Russia Pact and the, the Soviet army, so that way more familiar with the use of smoke? I, of, of course, know that in the Second World War it was also stated use smoke. But also, I know that I think, in the, especially in the later stages of the war, the Germans had quite problems with the use of smoke or that officers complained that it's not used enough. So, what is your take on this? Well, that. One thing is true that we uh, trained a lot the Verzögerungsgefecht uh, to like create a meat grinder where you can uh, create several lines of defense where you uh, let the enemy go in and uh, make his number smaller. But also you have uh, after this the possibility to make like a counterattack against these uh, weakened enemy forces to regain your territories. So it's not only pushing uh, or going back, but also uh, returning to forward positions if possible. And uh, you have to think with both ways. I mean, you can uh, use this tank for offensive situations, like spearheads, but also for defensive situations. And everything uh, can turn into each other. If you are attacking and you are faced with uh, way higher enemies than you expected, you need to retreat. You can just uh, keep standing there and die. Yeah, I remember when talking to Chifton about um, tank ramming, I think he mentioned when, when you come in this and this situation, and he said, yeah, the first thing is I, I tell drop smoke and drive backwards or something to gain some distance. Yes. We also uh, learned uh, some uh, basic situations, we called them, uh, standard situationen. That's uh, how you behave when you come into a certain uh, situation. For example, infantry is close to you. Or what do you do if you face uh, multiple enemies or enemy tanks? What do you do with uh, fewer tanks as enemy? For example, you have four tanks and you have faced two tanks. What do you do if the enemy has eight tanks and you have four tanks? And uh, there are some basic things that you, that you train all the way. Every year, uh, and even the younger uh, soldiers getting trained on tanks get used to it. And it's not only that the commander needs to know this, but also a gunner, driver, loader. So everyone knows what to do even without uh, directly commanding it. It's just to save uh, time. If everyone knows inside the tank what's going on, what's the situation outside of the tank, because you know that you have in a tank just limited uh, visibility, and uh, when you get attacked, the best thing is to do uh, either popping smoke and getting out or uh, firing everything you have. 
just to keep the enemy down. Because if you are a soldier with an RPG and you're firing at the tank and uh, 125 millimeter or 120 millimeter round buzzing next to you, it will keep you down. You won't uh, peek out uh, so fast uh, anymore. Same goes with the machine gun. Just uh, pray and spray, basically, just to keep the enemy down. That gives you a chance to react. And that's also what automatically comes. When the tank gets engaged, uh, the, uh, the gunner should directly do his work without the commander telling him first. Uh, that just uh, saves uh, time between the reaction time of the commander, what should we do, and so on. It's the same with mines. When a driver sees a mine, he holds. He doesn't wait for the commander to tell him uh, to stop. Yeah, to keep the initiative and keep the decision loop as, as short as possible. Did, did you come across any videos where they actually deployed smoke in, in, the, in the conflict? I think I saw uh, T-64 tanks, videos from the Ukrainians deploying the smoke uh, in the extras. And I think BMPs. But from the Russian sides with the smoke launchers and the turret, I haven't seen a single one. I mean, I'm following this uh, currently mostly on Twitter with uh, different channels on both sides, on the pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian side, to get the view on both sides. But uh, I haven't seen smoke launchers and turrets uh, used yet. Only engine smoke. That's interesting. I mean, could could be that, that they don't have smoke grenades. Okay, that, that's very, very difficult to assess. Or that they, they just don't use them because they're not properly trained or, or don't use them know in what situation it's best. Did you also, what I would call, um, I think it's called Verbandsübung. So, so the issue is generally training first, you get basically used to your tank, and then you train in the, in the tank platoon or half platoon, and, and then you start training a company level. So all the different levels upward could you also, but I guess on the videos, you don't see if enough tanks wants to yet to kind of determine the, the training levels in in the in the formation or the the units or was there something well uh, what i saw with the tanks at least that the uh, tanks operated uh, more close together and uh, the, the distances between uh, the vehicles like uh, bmps if you mean this were under visible on the videos together mostly. I mean, uh, you rarely saw videos of the real uh, combined action together. We saw this earlier in the conflict in 2014 and 2015, how uh, forces uh, pushed over fields. We rarely saw this uh, now as well, like the helmet camera uh, footages of uh, attacks over fields. But this, uh, like a normal attack, like uh, in one line together with infantry and vehicles supporting. But it's, uh, again, depending on the situation and uh, in the area we look if you see the horrible losses uh, of uh, both sides in uh, Sumi area and the uh, fast pushes of the Russians in Kherson area, it's also depending there on the units that were used. I, I think that the training levels are different in the Russian army, at least, similar to the Ukrainians. Yeah, I think it was something with, with, with the interview with, with Stanimi over there he, that he mentioned that in the south they have one army at least that, that had done way better and there was different training because they previously have fought in Georgia in 2008. You just see uh, how fast they captured uh, um, Herson uh, compared to uh, the failure in Sharkiv or the long combats around Sumi and the heavy losses uh, north of Kiev where complete uh, units, for example, um, VDV of their um, vehicles like the BMD, if I'm right. How many they lost uh, in towns, for example. So the BMD is basically an, a lighter version of the BMP. With, so it's an, a kind of lightweight uh, infantry fighting vehicle. Is this a correct classification? I would say so, yes. It's uh, smaller and uh, it's airdroppable. That's uh, the reason why it's used with the VDV forces. So in terms of tank combat, do you, did you see anything that was particularly noteworthy in terms of well, say bad or good performance? Well, what I saw in the beginning, there was a video, I don't know if you saw it, where a Russian tank destroyed a Ukrainian tank on very short distance, like 200 or 300 meters, while cars were uh, still driving around between them. I, I think I saw that one. I think one guy talked to the tank and suddenly the tank was hit. Yeah. 
But what I saw that in many situations, when the tank got engaged, um, the tank did nothing. He didn't uh, react to it at all. Like he uh, accepted his fate. But uh, you have to imagine, even if you don't know from where you get engaged, just fire back in the hope that you fire in the right direction. We saw a video of this uh, situation in the area of Mariupol, I think it was, of a column of BTRs that were attacking a town. And they got attacked by tanks from uh, from an ambush position. And the BTRs also started to spray first. They didn't know from where it was coming, but the first thing was uh, spray, return fire. And that was, uh, let's say, the, the right uh, decision. But there's also this famous video of uh, tanks driving down a road. And it was uh, filmed by a commercial drone where they got attacked from the side, from like a roadside ditch. And they did nothing. They just stopped and started to look for the enemy instead of either driving off, driving back, or start firing and, and uh, breaking through the enemy lines. The worst thing that you can do is just stopping because it makes uh, aiming at you even easier. Yeah, you get a sitting duck. So yeah, you give up your mobility for defense. And and we should also add here for, for most people, so firing back in the general direction creates basically suppression. Now. In, I mean, it depends. There are some computer games that now actually have some mechanics for it, but it cannot be stressed enough how important suppression is in real-life combat. This is usually not really displayed well in public media. Oh, and, but I specifically remember a lot of uh, combat reports of the Second World War where they said, like, for instance, for the Stuka dive bomber, uh, the actual material damage, what, what we did was rather low, but the suppression was extreme. And if the enemy is, is suppressed, he's basically not combat effective. And this is the, the most important thing you need to do. If the enemy is not combat effective, you can capture him or drive him out of the position. So if you can increase the suppression on the enemy, he, he gets less combat effective. Yeah, and uh, what also many people don't know, uh, the limited visibility is from inside the tank. You have uh, just a narrow uh, viewport around the tank. And uh, for the most Russian tanks, they don't even have a 360 degree uh, turnable commander side. So you have limited uh, view inside the tank. And it's easier to see things that are far away from the tank than to see uh, things that are close to you. Because of the high zoom, for example, with the optics. It's easier to, to spot something 500 meters in front of you than someone sitting next to your tank. and. If your tank gets uh, attacked from the side, at least the tank behind you or the tank behind them should be able to see from where it's coming and suppress the enemy. So even if you can't uh, suppress the guy who is shooting at you, your other tanks can do. And that's why you have to operate in platoons and not alone. And uh, also keep in mind, the normal infantryist don't know the capabilities of a tank. He doesn't know that the tank uh, probably doesn't see you. He just hears the, the machine gun firing, the main gun firing, and he instinctively thinks that he's getting shot at. Yeah. And that will force him down. And, and it is, again, very similar to the, to the Second World War, they specifically noted about the anti-tank infantry teams. The closer they get to the tank, the more secure they are, basically, because at, at one point, they're really, they're really dead zones on a tank where they can't see anything, even if, if they have uh, the proper vision blocks there and look in the cor uh, at the correct spot but as you as you mentioned yeah it's basically on uh, it's it's optimized for looking looking at the distance also what i saw where commercial drones that you can buy everywhere on ebay or amazon are used for reconnaissance these drones don't have any terminal they don't have radar and uh, we learned uh, if we we are if we are not in combat and we are in like the rear area inside forest that we have to hide our tanks with bushes, with uh, putting trees onto it, basically make the tank into a bush. And if you do it well, you can spot the tank from 100 meter distance. But we see uh, like no vegetation uh, camouflage on site uh, the tanks in this conflict, or rarely. Yeah, I know this also for, from the camouflage. I remember, for, like, for instance, in the Wehrmacht also had it in manual the um, incorrect and correct camouflage. And there was the basic example like, you, you park your tanks next to buildings and you park them in the shade so that if there's a reconnaissance plane that they're harder to spot. 
and you get uh, rid of the, the the skid marks and everything on the ground as well. And if the if the sun changes, also the, the time and the shade changes, you also move around the tank as well. Basic aero reconnaissance practice from from the second world war in some cases might have helped there already because in that regard a lot doesn't have changed. I mean, a drone is way harder to pick off than a, a reconnaissance plane in the Second World War, but but still, if if their basic steps are apparently not taken, yes, yes, that's uh, what we see, because uh, getting uh, getting seen by these commercial uh, drones can be uh, avoided by proper camouflaging the vehicle, at least uh, to a certain degree. You can't hide from radar, you can't hide from uh, your thermal signature, but uh, from the normal eye, you can do stuff against it, even with the vegetation around your vehicle. And of course, we must add here, the thing is, there might be a lot of tanks that were properly camouflaged and not spotted by drones. We won't see that footage because nobody knows that they actually uh, flew by tank and, and, and made a video of it because it was so well camouflaged. So it's hard to tell if well, how much of we are seeing is, is are these some singular units that behave badly or was just a bad situation for a, a well-trained unit that was just caught off guard or if it's, if it's a major issue. But from, from most of the other behaviors like, like no deployment or very few deployments of smoke and others, it seems, it seems to be a major training issue on both sides. I mean, you look at the manuals from both West and East and these are all basic standard practices from what I know, right? Yes. Now, in, in terms of, of combat, I, I heard from people like against anti-tank guided missiles in the, in the Cold War, the Western tankers learned the so-called SEGA dance. The SEGA was one of the first anti-tank guided missiles by the Soviets, effectively employed in the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And so there are several ways to deal if you're engaged with an anti-tank guided missile because it's it's rather slow flying in comparison to a cannon. You were trained in, or you also know from the manuals, there are various ways you deal with these. What what ways are to deal if you're engaged by an anti-tank missile and how often did you see anything on this on videos? Well, we uh, saw... Uh, some time ago, uh, a video of a T-80 getting engaged by, uh, I think, Stukner, and it just hit the machine gun of the commander. But uh, we trained for uh, avoiding ATGMs, and it's a procedure since, I think, the 70s or even the 60s already, when uh, Malyutka got uh, introduced. The SEGA is the NATO code name, and Malyutka is the original Soviet name. Yes. Yeah, uh, keep in mind, uh, you have to spot the ATGM. It's not always possible. But if you spot that you have sometimes in the maximum engagement uh, range of ATGM, sometimes even 10 seconds time to react. That's a lot of time in a combat situation. It's enough to deploy smoke and it's enough to start reversing. And the best thing you can do is zigzag while reversing. So you have the smoke between you and the ATGM and you drive away in a zigzag so he doesn't know exactly where to aim. But it's also important to give the information about the ATGM to your following tanks. For example, at GM, 2 o'clock near the building. So he, they can engage them. If they fire next to this launcher, maybe they scare the uh, operator. Keep in mind here, these ATGMs are guided missiles, so they are guided by the operators. This means if they are engaged, they are in trouble. And this is, for instance, the Israelis had a lot of losses uh, initially against the Sagas, but then they started to basically suppress the operators and well, the, the effectiveness of the, of the SEGA teams dropped dramatically. So the best probably is, yeah, um, drop smoke, reverse, zigzag, and, 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 the, and somebody engages the, the operator or the supposed location of the operator as well. And also uh, keep in mind that SEGA or Malyutka is in one point similar to the Ukrainian used Stukna that the operator doesn't sit exactly at the launch point. He, he sits uh, mm. like some distance away from it. So even if you don't hit exactly the position from where the rocket is coming from, you still have the chance of hitting near where the operator sits. And also it's important to, to tell your following tanks that the ATGM comes so they can react as well, so not the operator just switch his target while the rocket's on the way. And what we saw basically was uh, mostly in these uh, Stukna videos 
that uh, they picked up uh, one tank one by one because they were just alone, sometimes even just standing in the open field without moving. Some vehicles were moving, but uh, we saw a lot of videos of just standing vehicles. And, and in some cases, those could have been abandoned, but, I, but I, I guess it's unlikely that you abandon a tank in an open field. Then again, yeah, it's hard to tell. I mean, I saw uh, in several uh, guidelines that I read that you should move your tank at least after every 7 to 10, 10 seconds and that you should uh, drive the tank that way that you should uh, reach a cover uh, in less than 10 seconds. So if you get engaged with ATGMs that you can drive into a cover, in a, into a ditch, behind a barn, uh, behind a group of trees, and so on. So that you look already, where do I want to drive so I could go, for example, there to the left into a cover. Not just like taking an open field and I will cross this field. No, that's uh, the most idiotic thing that you can do if there's a fear of ATGMs. Yeah, so if you cross an open field, then at least deploy smoke or suppress the the supposed positions where the enemy could be located, I assume. Yes, that's at least a thing from Western doctrines that you should not show your tank for longer than 10 seconds or to drive from the, uh, cover to cover to just avoid this uh, getting engaged and not uh, standing in like a tree line and just waiting there. Is, is there also the, the concept of, uh, how is it called, um, I know it from the second world, but it's, I think it's dashing. So basically, you have a, if you have a platoon of four tanks, two tanks go into overwatch and two tanks move. And then those two that, that move beforehand then go into overwatch and the other two move. Yes, that's uh, possible in advancing, but also in retreating, that you cover uh, the movement. Like there's a, a basic saying uh, in combat that there's no movement without uh, fire and no fire without movement. Feuer und Bewegung, ja. Ja, Feuer und Bewegung, yes. What's based? The tanks are driving, the tanks that are driving are have it not as easy to spot enemies like the tanks that are overwatching. And if they get engaged, the protecting tanks or the covering tanks can uh, hold down the enemy and give, of course, information to the advancing tanks. What's going on from where and so on. Did you see any anything like that in a video that you saw like discovering that tanks cover each other and move? I saw uh, such uh, situations uh, later, for example, in Mariupol. Uh, there, there were videos of uh, two tanks operating together and uh, on some other situations. Uh, so it was possible to see on both sides, on the Ukrainian and on the Russian side, uh, a bit later in the war. So if I understand this correctly, you, you saw some kind of improvement over the course of the war in, in the tactical proficiency, how, how tanks were employed? Yes, yes. It's uh, similar on a way like on the Syrian civil war. When we remember the videos of uh, tanks getting destroyed in Syria to uh, how they changed their tactics over the years in operating in groups like T-72s together with BMP-2s and the BMP-2s covering the tanks, firing into buildings and uh, holding down uh, infantry that is inside it. Uh, we also saw this difference uh, now in Ukraine. So the tanks aren't driving uh, like uh, stupid in, into towns anymore. They are using, uh, covering each other, uh, working together with, under, with other vehicles and uh, combined arms. And... Uh, that happened in Ukraine way faster than in Syria, because the war in Ukraine is only going for uh, four months now. And in Syria, it's for several years. But uh, this adapting to the current combat situation uh, is needed. And I think that they also need to adapt now to the problem of uh, civilian drones, because they are currently a big uh, troublemaker for both sides. Not much to add here from my side. So, Tobias, thank you very much for your time. No problem. And thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye. Bye. Be sure to check out Tobias' channel as well. See the link in the description and the pinned comment. Thank you to the Panzer Museum Monster and the Tank Museum at Bovington for inviting me several times in the past years. Big thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar.